Duke's Coffee TV at the IFX Expo in coordination with FX Street and Forex Peace Army. Joining me now in the booth, I'm joined by Glenn Stevens of Gain Capital. Glenn, thank you so much for coming in today. Happy to be here. Now, we're in Asia, and Asia is not just a technological hub, but also a financial hub. It's home to two of the BRIC nations and half of the, pop half of the population. With that in mind, and given that Asia does continue to outpace Europe, how important is this market? And similarly, how do you look to differentiate yourself within this region? It's interesting, and there's no doubt that the power of the Asian market, uh, particularly even the Chinese market as a subset of that, is a driving force in uh, multiple layers of the economy. I mean, it's, it goes without saying that any business publication or even regular publication you pick up is something about China or Asia making a move. So uh, whether it's uh, emerging finances or the number of people just like that, it's a tremendous driver for people's growth prospect. We recognize that. Um, 10 years ago when we first uh, came to the region and started to set up shop. And I think, to your point, the hard part is figuring out how do you differentiate yourself because, let's face it, we're in a commoditized product. When we're in FX trading, for example, or even non-FX products, whether it's metals or whether it's energy or whether it's euro, it's difficult to take a very vanilla product and differentiate. So how do you do that? You have to be local. You have to have a local presence, I believe. I believe you have to have a local understanding. You can superimpose your, in our case, U.S. operation into uh, Hong Kong, for example, and you should not expect it to fit in because there are cultural differences, there are style differences. So I think ultimately, you take this commoditized product, you take a look at the local needs of the market, whatever their styles are, whatever their cultural wants are, and try to shape it that way. It doesn't just stop at translating your website. It means putting features and functions and customer service oriented towards the psyche of that user base. So as much as it's a global market, you could argue that it's very local sometimes as well. Now, in an industry where competing solutions and tight spreads can often equal market share, who do you fear almost? Who do you consider to be your biggest competitor? Okay, that's a great question because I think it moves. When someone launches a new service, so for example, someone comes out with social trading or someone comes out with a, a better version of MT4 or what have you, or even a new proprietary platform, you have, to, you have to kind of evaluate it and engage it at the same time. You can't just dismiss it because if there are certain features about it that make sense, you need to adapt quickly. I think the most important thing to do when it comes to kind of eyeing up an opportunity is to be iterative. In other words, be nimble. And so if you look at our platform now, the way it looked from five years ago, two years ago, it's quite different. We add the products that we have or maybe a migration to mobile. So I think ultimately I wouldn't say that I fear a shop per se because sometimes it's a regional player that actually doesn't have a global footprint but does really well in that local market. And other times it's a new global player, let's say one of the largest providers in the world, and they come into a market and sometimes they fail. And so I think more importantly is to say who's getting traction and what about it is getting traction so it teaches you more about the customer. In its quarterly report, Forex Magnate suggests that MT4 represents approximately 20% of the retail market. Now, more and more brokers are adding different trading platforms. So, what are insiders using? What is the big FX trading platform that is growing the most? Okay, so um, the MT4 phenomenon is interesting because I think there's a little bit of uh, a kind of Apple to it. And I say that because an iPhone actually, many would say, isn't the best phone. It doesn't have the biggest screen, doesn't have the best functionality, but it's very intuitive and it's easy to use. And so people feel comfortable because you don't pick up a manual. And it appears that there's certain benefits to MT4 that make it easy to use. So take that idea and transfer it into say, what are the new things that work? The hard part, as far as I'm concerned, as running a company and trying to direct resources, is to figure out what's flash, and what's real. And so social trading, if we hear about that word one more time, you know, if I had a dollar for every time somebody said social, we, we would pay for the, this whole expo by ourselves. And the reality here is to say, well, are people really using it? So personally, I think that the ecosystem goal, in other words, where you can have customers, learn from other customers, get trading ideas, I think ultimately there are three stages to a customer. They trade themselves, they let somebody else trade for them, or there's that middle ground that says they make some of the decisions, but they're essentially a narrowed down subset, which means people give them ideas and then they review them. That to me is the sweet spot. That to me is what's going to be the upside. And so those platforms or those offerings that incorporate the most of that, 
I don't want to say middleware because I sound like a techie, I don't mean that, but middle ground where it's not truly self-directed, nor is it managed money. It's whoever can be the best in that middle spot, I think will do the best. And I think particularly in an Asian market where you have a customer who has a propensity and a, and a, and a real willingness to want to speculate, I think that they're going to be very adaptive to saying, give me some advice. Don't trade for me and don't tell me what to do, but I wouldn't mind some ideas. What then are the biggest challenges that you're facing when attracting new clients then? How as such is the trader profile changing and importantly, what are you guys doing in order to meet those changes? I think that comes into a segmentation exercise and what I mean by that is there's a mistake that many offerings do where they try to create the the average, right? And I think what we've found is there isn't an average. So for example, we'll have quite a few customers open up in the $2,000 range. I'll have quite a few customers that open up on the retail side in the $15,000 range. Now, the average of that is $8,500, but nobody opens up with $8,500. So if you gear your offering around, around whether it's promotions, rebates, uh, whatever it might be for $8,500, it's completely ineffective. So, so there's a time where you can have data rule your decisions and be wrong. So instead, you need to bifurcate your offerings and say, well, let me look at somebody who's kind of a ten dollars to $20,000 player. What does that mean? What is their profile? Are going to look like, what level of service do they expect? And let me look at the 2000 and under profile and say someone's going to open up with $500. Different psyche and different customer. So I think for us, number one is to segment our offerings, whether it's the services, whether it's the, um, the cost engaged, whether it's the spread. So, for example, worrying about certain uh, funding options for a larger customer is less worrisome because they have access. Whereas someone who's smaller, make it ease of use because it needs to be a point of purchase sale almost. So for us, what we're trying to do is, is particularly segment the Asian market, if you will, as looking at types of customers. And what we're seeing so far is kind of a stratified retail user, which is call it 2,500 and below and kind of 15,000 and above. And they, and they do have different approaches. And lastly, Glenn, obviously we hope that everything goes well all the time, but sometimes there can be errors, almost sometimes. How then do you deal with client complaints? What's your structure on in terms of rectifying errors? You know, do you talk to the client directly or, or do you go for a more, a more neutral stance? It's a great question because it's even the nature of the problem. And what I mean by that is, is that particularly in a market like China, for example, there are challenges for lack of a politically incorrect term, with the internet service, with uptime, with stability. Now, you can take the approach to basically punt on every complaint, and every time a customer calls up, say, it wasn't me. And I think back in the day, they used to call that bullfighting. When the bull comes in, you get out of the way, and he passes past you. But ultimately, you don't become very friendly with the bull, right, because he still wants to gore you. So we don't want our customers to want to gore me. And so, <laughs> so by that, I mean is that I don't want to deflect. I want to be able to understand. So on, the, on some cases where it truly is an infrastructure problem in a country, for example, um, you know, some, some mobile bandwidth is challenged in many areas. So it makes it hard to deliver the funding option on your product. You can't do a download. So in those cases, you have to say, OK, yes, it's a problem. Here's some alternatives. For us, we spend a lot of time on FAQs, not for customers to find out themselves, but to train our reps so that they can quickly kind of identify the nature of a problem and not just get into a defensive mode. And look, we get, we're going to have errors too. We're not perfect. And I don't care who interviews after me and says that they are, nobody is. But it's about how you deal with the problem once it happens. And so for us, we have a very distinct escalation problem, uh, escalation process, which means that for reps, goes up to managers, goes up to specialists who can deal with it on several levels. The other thing, again, is understanding your customer. Don't have people in the US providing customer service for people in Hong Kong and vice versa. We've already seen that outsourcing crashes and burns very quickly. So I think number one, try to have similar kind of cultural client and service. Number two, have very distinct escalation policies so that I think more important than anything is a customer feels like they're being heard. And the worst thing you can do is say, I'll get back to you and leave them hanging. If you can keep them posted as to what's going on, I think they can understand better and they can get an answer because they're probably just upset for a little bit of time. Glenn, thank you so much for joining us. Thank My pleasure. You. Good seeing you. CEO Glenn Stevens there of Gain Capital. Don't go away. We'll be back with plenty more exclusive interviews for you here at the IFX Expo Asia. Goodbye for now.